Hello, everybody. Ali Duzet here. And today I wanted to give you a quick update as to what is exactly going on in the world right now, because a lot is happening. Now, I have kind of like a lot of kids and I'm watching them solo right now. And I hope that they're all distracted. And I thought, OK, I have a minute. I'm going to try and record. So here we go. Trying to record. Um, let's see. I'll stop my video. OK. A lot of things are happening, and I wrote a big post about this on Facebook, uh, my personal page, Ali Duzet. Um, so if you want to see it all written out, it's over there. Uh, my Facebook group is Intuitive he Healing with Ali Duzet, and I recommend getting in on that. Um, but let's talk about what's going on right now, because a whole lot is going on, and we're all going to be impacted by it. And we already are being impacted by it, but we're going to be impacted more so in the very near future. So the first thing that we have to be aware of is fertilizer issues. A lot of us already know that Russia and Ukraine export 28% of the world's phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizers, but they are obviously not exporting right now. Over a quarter of the world's phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizer is unavailable because of this. And in 2021, fertilizer costs in the U.S. soared by 80%. As of May of 2022, fertilizer costs went up by an additional 30%. So we're seeing a situation of fertilizer scarcity. One second. So we're having this situation where the costs of fertilizer are going up drastically. And who is impacted by that? Well, farmers. And who is impacted by that? Well, everybody, because we all depend on food that we get from farmers. Now they have that much less money to go around. Um, it's going to cause this rise in food prices, right? Um, but the thing is that pesticide, it's not just fertilizer, it's also pesticide. So these are just some things I, some screenshots I took this morning. Um, dealing with pesticide shortages in 2022, off the charts, chemical shortages hit U.S. farms. Plan now in 2021 for herbicide shortages in 2022. Look at that. Retailers and basic suppliers are all very concerned about herbicide shortages in 2022. I've been told there will be no carryover herbicides to fill holes in 2022. The probability of herbicides not being available is much more likely. Um, so, okay, and so this is from earlier in the year, February the 9th. Um, this is from last month. Um, but I was seeing that there are big shortages right now of especially things like glyphosate, which, you know, so I... I don't think glyphosate is good, but the fact is that so many farms depend on it right now. Like they, they have not put in the infrastructure to be able to handle, handle growing without it. That's the big problem. It's not, I mean, oh man, well that, that brings us to Sri Lanka, but I, I wasn't going to talk about that today. But the thing that's important to know is fertilizer shortages are happening. Pesticide shortages are also happening. So we have a situation where it's harder to grow crops it's harder to keep them alive and safe from bugs. So what does that mean? It means um, less crops and different crops. I've heard of a lot of farmers who are growing different types of foods this year than they normally do because they're cheaper, because they require different kinds of pest control. Um, basically, the way that farmers are going to be adapting to these shortages is going to be by switching up their game. But when they switch up their game, it switches up what you can eat, right? And how much things are going to cost for you. Now, we all hopefully know that Ukraine and Russia are the world's breadbasket, and they are currently busy with other things, um, and so they are not producing and exporting over a third of the planet's wheat and barley, which is what they normally are up to. With one third of the wheat and barley out of circulation for the planet, people are going to feel this globally. We're going to feel this all over the planet. A third of global wheat and barley supply, like that is a big chunk of food that a lot of people are usually depending on. Gas prices right now ah, are dropping, um, but how long will this last? And so there's a lot going on with that that I didn't want to get into, but you may have noticed that gas prices today are a little bit lower than they were a month ago. Um, is that sustainable? How long will that last? You know, it's kind of up for debate, but here's something that nobody is talking about. Um, refined coal production went down drastically. You can see right here. There was a tax credit, a tax credit um, linked to refined coal production, and it ended right there. And you can see the steep drop. Refined coal production in the United States dropped to nearly zero during the first quarter of 2022 as refined coal consumers used their remaining small stockpiles. Um, so this could be affecting refined coal production and consumption. Refined coal makes up almost a quarter of total coal used in the United States. 
coal in total makes up about a quarter of U.S. electricity. We get about a quarter of our electricity from coal nationwide. And so we are seeing maybe a 5 to 6% decrease in what is available for electricity nationwide because of this refined coal situation. And I have not really seen anybody talking about this, but still worth talking about. Um, in the meantime, natural gas actually is responsible for 38% of the electricity available in the United States. So basically most of most of the electricity that we enjoy here is created with fossil fuels, natural gas, and burning coal. And prices have risen 48% in the past month. Like that is a huge, huge leap. And the, the thing is that it's not just going to affect your bottom line as a homeowner, because this is, again, how you heat and cool your house is with this stuff. You know, it's going to affect your utility bills. Um, but it's also going to affect many industries that depend on natural gas for a whole variety of reasons. A lot of industries do. And so what that is going to do is make the prices of all manufactured goods rise to cover the increase in natural gas prices. So this is something worth keeping an eye on. So those are those both have to do with how we create electricity in the United States. Um, remember back in the olden days in 2021 that um, Elon Musk said that if we're going to start using electric cars, we need to double our electricity generating capacity, right? So we need way more electricity to enjoy the, uh, you know, proposed future of electric vehicles. But how are we going to do that? You know, if we're the more people that buy electric cars, the more electricity we actually need to produce to fuel those cars. And we're seeing these situations where natural gas is getting harder to get and more expensive and the same with coal. So this could be kind of a little bit of a disaster. Um, this is from yesterday when the Postal Service uh, said it was going to buy tons of electronic mail trucks. Okay, they are buying 33,800 electronic mail trucks. Okay, so what could go wrong? We just need a ton of electricity to make it happen. Now, that was all in the United States, but let's talk about Europe for a minute. Um, Nord Stream is back on, but only at 40%. So Nord Stream is this tube of, I mean, it's a pipeline of natural gas, okay? Um, this, I just searched up, you know, Nord Stream, Russia, and on Google, and these are the things that came up for today. Um, but it carries natural gas into Europe. And a lot of Europeans were afraid that Putin wouldn't turn it back on out of retribution for how Europe views the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, but they did turn it back on, so hooray. But they're only flowing it at 40% of capacity. So that's less than half. Putin has said that they may decrease or end the flow in the future. So if you see that, that's this. Putin signals Russia gas pipeline Nord Stream will restart, but with conditions, you know. Amid new Putin warning, there tells members to cut gas usage amid new Putin warning. And so the warning is he might decrease or end the flow. So the European Union is telling all of its member nations to reduce the demand of um, natural gas by 15% between August and March. So that's uh, also known as winter. And it's like extremely cold there in the winter, you know, in these northern countries, like it's really cold. And we're going to ask everybody to reduce demand by 15 percent, which doesn't sound like that much. But I will be willing to bet that uh, it will feel like a lot to the people that have to be 15 percent colder during an extremely cold period of time. Um, Germany is the manufacturing powerhouse of Europe, and many of their top industries require natural gas. So reductions in natural gas supplies is going to disrupt those industries, um, you know, if they have to reduce their dependence on natural gas. Um, that level of disruption will have consequences that we cannot even guess at yet. Like, we have no idea what it could impact. And I think a really great example of this is, um, you know, I have... Uh, some friends that are um, building right now and they are like building a house, right? And so they've been having a lot of trouble with their building because little things are missing. Like they have carpet, 
but they might not have like little tack strips to attach the carpet to the house, right? Or um, they'll be missing like one particular kind of nail and you could buy it in a small amount at, at Home Depot, but to buy enough for a whole house, you'd have to order it in bulk and they just, they're out of like that that one tiny piece. And so um, my friends, they were their house was supposed to be done back in like February, March, and it's still not done and it won't be done this month. It won't be done next month. Like who knows when it will be done, but it's all just these little tiny pieces. Um, because as it turns out, one little tiny piece is actually really important. Like these little tiny pieces that don't seem very important. You know, so what if, um, you know, some manufacturer has to cut nail production by X percent? It doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but it's a really big deal to that person who's building a house, but they can't finish it because there's not enough nails, right? So, um, so that is an example of how... Um, we're going to be seeing some weird, you know, disruptions in the marketplace that we just don't even know what those disruptions are going to be. Um, there's also a carbon dioxide shortage. So carbon dioxide is really needed. You know, we need it for our current way of life, at least in the United States. Um, first off, if you like soda pop, CO2 uh, is what makes your carbonated drinks carbonated. Um, but carbon dioxide is also used to preserve food. That's what is the air inside of your package of chicken at the grocery store. It's not air, it's carbon dioxide. I mean, like to the extent that carbon dioxide is air, yeah, it's air. But the air inside is basically straight carbon dioxide because it inhibits bacteria. And so, and additionally, carbon dioxide is used um, in making dry ice and so when we ship food, uh, these long distances, we're shipping food all the way across the continent. How we keep them, how we keep that food cool and safe is with carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is actually really important um, to our current way of life. And so there are admittedly often carbon dioxide shortages. They, the supplies of carbon dioxide fluctuate yearly naturally. And so I was reading a thing that normally they, um, you know, the, there's a big spike of carbon dioxide that's available for these manufacturers to use in like August through November. But then, you know, there's kind of a quieter time between like May and, you know, April, May, June, July. And so that's when they usually do their maintenance and stuff like that. But the fluctuations that we're seeing right this minute are abnormal. So there's, there's, you know, fluctuations always, but right now, allegedly, the fluctuations are abnormal. Okay. And again, I'm not like a super expert on this. This is just something I've been trying to follow. So um, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of fertilizer and pesticide production. So that's why there's this big shortage because we're seeing a big shortage or like a big reduction of fertilizer and pesticide manufacturing. And so when we reduce that, we're also going to really reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's available for use in what? Shipping food, preserving food, um, and, you know, carbonating drinks, but who cares about that? Like we would all be very sad probably if our, you know, Dr. Pepper and Coke went flat, but really we will really care when it's not possible to buy fresh ish chicken from the grocery store. And like, yes, of course, have your own chickens if you can, but I know that that's just not a lifestyle that is very attainable for most people. Um, okay. So this is a quote that I took from somewhere and maybe I have it on the next page. No, I don't. Um, but if you Google this, you'll find where it came from. Well, government, oh no, I copied it from my own self. I copied this from my own post, duh, okay. Um, while government officials have claimed that the carbon dioxide shortages will only increase prices slightly, the president of Advanced Cryogenics, who probably knows more about this than government officials know, has stated that the longer this continues, the more difficult supplies will become. As to when it will be resolved, all I can say is that at any time since the start of this contamination is too long. All of this leads to much higher prices, allocations, and significant shortages of product. And he said this on July 4th, 2022. And I forgot to mention up here, there is a contaminant in uh, the carbon dioxide supply. I don't know what contaminant it is, but a bunch of people were talking about it. So I, they must know what it is, but I'm assuming that this contaminant makes it so it's not safe for human consumption or like, you know, to be in a carbonated drink, to be in your chicken at the grocery store. Um, so that has further reduced supply and um, 
I mean, that guy says this is going to lead to higher prices, allocations, and significant shortages of product. This is all on top of general supply chain issues. Um, the American Truckers Association says that we are 80,000 truckers short here in the United States. Um, there's ongoing shipping issues at like the ports and the shipping container crisis uh, that people have been talking about. Um, and then, of course, we are still not over this this situation where industries that shut down for two weeks to stop the spread never caught up again. There are a bunch of manufacturers that just have never gotten themselves back up to speed since that time. And we're already feeling that and we're going to feel it additionally, like the more that we are experiencing an energy crisis, um, the more we're going to feel, you know, the lack from products that are just harder to get and harder to find. So this is, I this little break is to show you my trip to Walmart last week. So I have five kids. Um, my baby is just turned one and she needed new 12 month pants because I only brought a few and I don't even know what happened to them, but like she was out of pants. So we went to the Walmart. This is the baby pants section right here. And this was, I think another baby pants section or like baby shorts. Okay. And so you can see there's like not a lot going on and some assorted baby shorts at the bottom. Uh, this is a great view of the baby clothes section. And over here, uh, this one, you know, there were some dresses on this side and not on the other side. Um, so this is like the baby clothes options, which, you know, I hope un understandably made me kind of like freak out because I'm sitting there like, but my baby like really needs pants. And there's literally no pants at all in her size here and kind of also no pants at all. And I did end up finding some um, and there was like a stack of maybe like 10 little pairs of baby pants and it had a couple in size 12 months. So I was able to get get them and I bought two pairs of 18 month. And um, but man, it was tough to find to find the items that I needed. And one thing to note about this is that a lot of these items from Walmart are really being sourced from China. And from Asia, you know, like Vietnam and Thailand and stuff like that. And so they're coming across on these container ships across the Pacific to California. And so this shipping crisis, you know, and the trucker crisis, it's going to make it so that uh, cities on the East Coast are going to take longer to be resupplied than cities on the West Coast. Basically, the further West you are, the closer you are to these ports, the less the less distance the truckers actually have to drive to these stores. So um so this is much more severe than I have seen in my home state of Utah. Um, but man, still like even so, oh my gosh, this was a very stressful trip to Walmart. And then I took this picture because I was so sad. This is my favorite thing, peanut butter M&Ms, and they were all gone and many other things were gone. And I just didn't airdrop them all to my computer to make this presentation, but I was snapping pictures of all sorts of empty shelves. There's empty shelves of food, empty shelves of clothes. And as I was walking through this, uh, this candy aisle right here, trying to find, you know, my dream candy, uh, <laughs> the people next to me were talking to each other and they were just saying, oh my gosh, they have almost nothing. Like all of this stuff is gone. Like, where is everything? And I didn't, I didn't say anything, but in my heart, I just thought, yeah, like, where is everything, man? Like, where is everything exactly? So this is an example of the supply chain issues that we're going to be dealing with. Um, this is a from, this is from that. So the lights are about to go out in America, warned grid experts. This is from, um, what, two weeks ago or one week ago by Ethan Huff. Um, okay, so according to Ralph Izzo, head of the New Jersey-based Public Service Enterprise Group, energy utilities are having to be frugal with their replacement parts inventories in order to avoid running out in the event of a weather emergency or even just a few consecutive days of heavy heat. You don't want to deplete your inventory because you don't know when that storm is coming, but you know it's coming. If we have successive days of 100 degree heat, those pole top transformers, they start popping like Rice Krispies, and we would not have the supply stack to replace them, he is quoted as saying. Nick Akins, head of the Ohio-based grid operator AEP, added that many utility operators are changing their maintenance habits as well. We're doing a lot more splicing, putting the cables together instead of laying new cable because we're trying to maintain our new cable for inventory when we need it, Aiken says. Um, uh, yikes. Uh, is that the correct response? I'm sitting here like, 
uh, holy cow, this is not what you want to hear. You don't want to hear about uh, pull top transformers popping like Rice Krispies. And so they're, you, you know, doing their maintenance by splicing things together instead of laying new cable. Like, yikes. I mean, I don't even know if those are connected. I'm not an electrician, but like this, this little set of paragraphs left me going, oh boy, oh my goodness. You know, as long as we're having these supply chain issues, uh, we could be looking at a whole bunch of bigger issues than we realize. And we still have, you know, another month of very high, I mean, it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere and it's been a hot summer. And then we're going to throw ourselves into the winter. And between the natural gas issues and these maintenance issues, supply chain issues, this could be really interesting. Now, I didn't even mention Sri Lanka, but of course, in Sri Lanka, really quick. Well, here's what I didn't mention. Sri Lanka, a run on the banks in China, the peso crisis, other currency crises, and New York City's PSA on nuclear war. Um, but things are getting real. I do want to mention Sri Lanka super fast. Um, Sri Lanka earlier in the legislative year um, banned uh, non-organic pesticides and fertilizers, but they did not import fertilizer and pesticide to replace the non-organic kinds. And so basically farmers just had their yield slashed by 90%. Um, now everybody is starving. And last thing that I heard, they were like storming the president's house and attacking him. And, you know, it's been a disaster. Uh, I think the military was authorized to use all necessary force to control the population. They're starving. Like they have no food. And that is the future of these crazy policies that are leading to fertilizer and pesticide decrease you know and so just for the record like my degree is in soil sciences and environmental sciences i am very pro the environment you know as a human um but you know i and and i'm a big believer in organic pesticide and organic fertilizer and i know that it can work but for it to work you have to be really trained you have to know what you're doing you have to have the necessary supplies just just destroying the old way of conventional pesticide and fertilizer is not the way to do this all it does is throw everybody under the bus and drastically reduce yield you know as we work as a planet to try and get more environmentally friendly farming situations set up you know we have to do that in a smart way and not just by banning the things that we don't like there has to be an alternative and we're kind of seeing that with Europe's uh, energy crisis as well. This was like the most silly. Here's the thing. I mean, it was like so preventable, you know, but they've been trying so hard to switch over to eco-friendly options that, uh, but, but not thinking ahead enough, you know, basically, look, there's a lot of problems with these non-renewable resources that we use, but we are already using them. And in order to get things in a more sustainable track, you have to do it in a smart way or people get hurt. People go hungry, people get cold. And sometimes those things lead to situations that are quite dire for everybody involved. Now, America's second Pluto return just happened. So um, I, in addition to, you know, having a degree in, you know, environmental science and all of that stuff, I also work as an astrologer. I'm a Christian. Um, so I view that through a Christian lens and I've written and um, done a lot of YouTube videos on the Pluto return. Um, but our second Pluto return just happened and Pluto returns, um, are associated with the destruction of society basically, and the rebirth of it, a rebuilding Pluto trims what is dead so that new growth can occur. And when we look at what is corrupt and, you know, emotionally and morally dead in our nation, uh, there's probably a lot for Pluto to trim. And the trimming is really going to start taking place after December 28th. But in the meantime, um, we're right here between uh, Pluto returns number two and three, July 11th and December 28th. That's going to be with the midterms right in between. Uh, and this is a time when there's going to be some things that organically show up in our national experience that are going to kind of test us as a nation and see how committed we are to the course that we're on. And by the course that we're on, I'm, I, I think what our real question is, um, is if we're a Christian nation or not, just because 
um, America was founded um, initially, I mean, as a nation, when uh, the pilgrims first landed. And of course, like all honor to the indigenous people of America, but um, we had these pilgrims arrive, these religious pilgrims in 1620. And it's been 400 years since they arrived exactly. Um, and they arrived and signed the Mayflower Compact that swore that this would be a Christian nation and that they would keep the commandments that God had put out in the Bible. And um, it was a covenant that the settlers, at least the European settlers of this land, made a covenant that they would be Christian, be a Christian nation. And now we're seeing that, um, you know, are we? That's the big question. Are we really? Are we keeping that or not? And uh, I think we're going to see some more situations in the next couple of months that are really going to illustrate where we are uh, in our national trajectory. Are we committed to being a Christian nation? Are we committed to not being a Christian nation? Which course are we going to select as a nation? And then again, we have these 2022 midterms coming up right in between these two Pluto returns. And I have a bunch more about all of that here on this YouTube channel. Um, come and join my Facebook group, Intuitive Healing with Ali Duzette. We talk about this stuff. Um, but additionally, the Shemitah year ends on September 26th. And that is a Hebrew way of measuring years. But basically, every seven years, uh, you have a Sabbath year. And that year... Um, I mean, man, there's a bunch in the Bible about it, but we don't really honor it now, but it still seems that it's an important thing. And a great uh, book to read is called this. Uh, nope. I'm going to, I'm not, I can't remember it. It might be called the secret of the Shemitah or something like that by Jonathan Kahn, C-H-A-N. No, sorry. C-A-H-N. Jonathan Kahn. I think that's how you spell his name. But other notable recent Shemitah years ended on September 17th, 2001. So that was the day that the stock market opened after 9-11. And um, the, stock, the economic crash in September of 2008 also coincided with that year's, um, the end of the Shemitah year. Mm -hmm. And so um, as far as I could find, the Shemitah year in 2015 was quieter. But here we are again, and it's another Shemitah year ending on September 26th. And so typically with Shemitah years, just big, weird stuff happens. And so I would just not be surprised if something big and weird happened, um, you know, uh, in the month of September. That would not surprise me, especially in the latter two weeks of September. I would not be surprised. So again, not guaranteeing anything like you just never know what's going to happen, but it would not be surprising if something pretty weird happened in there. In the meantime, Pluto entered Capricorn in 2008 at the same time that the housing bubble was exploding and everything was falling apart. Um, and now it's going to exit in March of 2023. So we're almost to the point where Pluto is going to go and hit Aquarius. Um, when Pluto shifts signs, there's usually something like a big death and rebirth sort of moment relating to whatever Pluto is up to. Capricorn governs the economy. That's why we had an economic crash in 2008 when Pluto entered, and I would expect another one um, in the region of March 2023, like give or take about four months. And so it would not surprise me if we had some big currency issues showing up in November of 2022. This is a global energy. All of the humans on the planet are impacted by this. And so I'm going to make some more videos about this, but that's just something to be aware of that, you know, in my opinion, God made the planets and he set, I mean, in the book of Genesis, it says that he ordained the planets to be for times and seasons, the stars to be for times and seasons. And uh, in Psalms, you know, it talks about how the planets uh, give forth their wisdom and they speak day and night. You know, they're speaking wisdom day and night. And to me, this is some of that wisdom. Keep your eyes peeled because we could be in for some big economic roller coasters, especially between November and then what four months after March is going to be March, April, May, June, July. So, you know, November through July of this upcoming, you know, this upcoming November and July, I think we're going to see some really big stuff um, that I think pretty much everybody's going to be impacted by that. Um, so Pluto is exiting Capricorn, but it's entering Aquarius and Aquarius governs power grids, governs energy supplies. 
it governs also technology. And so I am really interested to see what that ends up looking like for everybody. Um, but my guess is that we're going to be seeing some big shifts when it comes to uh, the grid, uh, energy, and then also just all technology. What would it be like if you lost access to your technology? What would it be like if we discovered that the powers that be have access to way more technology than we realized, and maybe they were willing to use it in ways that we didn't agree with? You know, I think we're going to see some big shifts with technology and We'll just have to see how that shows up, but it's around the corner. This is taking place in March. Um, so all of this is to say, this is my invitation to you to tune in with God and ask what you need to do for you in this crazy time. You know, what do you need to do um, to make sure that you're on the right path for whatever you need to do next in your life mission? You know, everybody's situations are different. We all have different jobs to do on this planet, like different divine missions and different situations. And you are entitled to divine revelation on what you need to do for your unique situation. I recommend focusing on healing your nervous system. And that is my big obsession. And I have a ton of stuff in AllieDuzetteClasses.com for that. And everything that you do in there is going to benefit your nervous system. And most of the things in there are by donation, but I recommend starting in the free offerings so that you understand what's going on. But the more you can do to heal your nervous system right now, the better off you're going to be as the stress picks up because we're going to get more stressed. And I, oh my gosh, uh, there were three homicides in my hometown this week. Three of them. I live in a small town in Utah, three homicides and um, unrelated. And they all seem like people were crazy. And I just feel like people are going crazy. And then I'm, I'm visiting here in Maryland right now. And um, somebody I was talking to uh, manages a town. And she said that there have been two SWAT team incidents in this neighborhood in, uh, and it's a nice neighborhood. Like it's kind of like a fancy pants neighborhood, <laughs> two SWAT team incidents, uh, in the past month. And just, and all of the people in her town are, are being crazy. Like people are stressed out of their minds with everything that's going on, the money concerns and all the other concerns that are showing up as far as people are scared of illness and, um, worried about gas prices and groceries and all of these things. And, um, people are fried, you know, it's our nervous systems. But the thing is, I think that our nervous systems are going to have to deal with a lot more than they currently are. And it's up to us to prepare our nervous systems. Now we need to train our nervous systems now to handle this craziness that's coming so that we don't lose our mind and do horrible things, you know, and so that we don't end up depressed and stressed and upset and unable to cope with our lives. Now, I know that everybody is dealing with alert fatigue. And what that refers to is this concept of, um, you know, warning, warning. The first time you hear that, you know, fire alarm, you're like, oh my gosh, a fire. And you run out. And then if it's not a big deal, then you're like, okay, well, guess it wasn't a big deal. Uh, you know, a few times of that and you stop paying attention to the fire alarm. Right. And I think that's where we kind of all are as a society is that everybody's just tired. You know, like I was reading this article about the Rona and um, people were talking about how now these these scientists are saying, well, you have to do this to protect yourself from COVID. You have to do that to protect yourself from COVID. Um, and then the responses of people is just like, I'm over it. Like, I'm done worrying about this. I'm over it. And even if so so these scientists were saying like but our warnings are so important you know and if people just ignore it it's going to be a big problem and you know is that true or not i like i don't want to comment on that but i will say that the alert fatigue is real right everybody is just tired of being told to be on high alert all the time you can't live your life on high alert all the time it will destroy your nervous system and your nervous system runs literally all the parts of your body. So if you destroy that, you've destroyed everything. And that's a big problem. So uh, I know you're tired of this. And I'm tired too. I am tired too. This whole situation is ridiculous. But I do think it's going to be worse before it gets better. So we have to rest and recharge because the fun is about to begin. It hasn't started yet. We've been in the prelude zone. And now it's starting to get real. Um, so... 
Okay, so I am working on creating a meditation challenge, 40 day meditation challenge to help our nervous systems. And I'm going to be running that out of Intuitive Healing with Ali Duzette on Facebook. Um, and I really invite you to set a timer, like set a timer for 10 minutes and seek some divine wisdom on what to do for your own life. You know, go and ask God what you need to know, what you need to do in order to make the coming months as easy for yourself as possible. And then listen, and then write down the answers that you get and then take action, you know, then actually act on whatever comes to you, even if it doesn't make sense. And um, I got, had a comment in my Facebook group today by, about somebody that said she felt really compelled to buy dog grooming supplies. And she's like watching dog grooming videos. I love that. And I have, um, you know, a teacher that always said that she always felt like she did not need to get food storage. And guess what? Maybe you don't. And so, and in, in that case, it would be a waste of your money for whatever reason, but I urge you not to go crazy and just start panicking. I urge you to um, focus on your relationship with God and with your own body and your own nervous system. Focus on learning how to control your nervous system and cool it down so that you can be calm in situations of stress and focus on connecting with God so that you can get tailor-made advice and instruction on what to do so that you can experience your best life no matter what is going on with the global situation. Um, you can be led in the ways that are right for you to handle whatever is coming next in your life. So thank you so much for being here. And I hope that you have the best day of all. I'll talk to you later.